Hello Internet, Dave here, and welcome to a Let's Build of a Submarine Spitfire 3D model. I got this for Christmas, thank you very much, the person that gave it to me. It is roughly going to take me approximately 3 to 4 hours, as it says on the box. Don't worry, this video will not be 3 to 4 hours long. It will be sped up. Uh, basically, it is a um, push-out uh, model, as you can see here. We'll have a, a windscreen. We've got the uh, rest and bits and pieces here in the box. During the video, which I will be speeding up, I will talk about the Spitfire's history, about the person that made it, fitting, fitting as much as I can into the video. So, without any further ado, let's get that out of the box. Let's move the box out of the way. Let's get this open and then get this started. Okay, just before I get started, this is how big it is. This is my hand. That's the scale of this build. It is probably going to be one of my largest builds I've ever done. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Apparently when this thing's going to be finished, it's going to be... 44 centimeters by 53 centimeters by 18 centimeters. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy this. Machines have the everlasting apparel of the Spitfire. This legendary fighter has its internal organs as a seaplane. The outright winner of the Salonia Trophy. Using experience gained from these speed trials, the aircraft design was notable for the use of elegant ecliptical wings. The only fighter constructed for the whole of World War II. Spitfire was constantly upgraded and improved to keep it one step ahead of all other fighter planes. The Mark IX, which forms the basis of this puzzle model, was the variant introduced in 1942 to counter the initial supremacy of the FW-190. In Initial production of the Spitfire began in 1936 at the Woodston Supermoon Factory in Southampton. Development of the new aircraft, combined with the assembly of Supermoon's more traditional planes, Warus and Strasser flying boats, limited factory space led to delays which became so critical that the Air Ministry postponed production should stop once the integral 310 planes had been built. Supermarine had to convince the Air Ministry that the problems could be overcome before further orders for 200 Spitfires were placed in March 1938. The problem with manufacturing capacity led to the conclusion that a new factory required and, a, and Castle Bromwich in Birmingham was chosen as the site. Built next to the Castle Bromwich Aerodrome, the new factory used mass production skills drawn from the car industry. Specifically, the know-how of Lord Nutfield and Morris Motors, mass marketing car making and precision aircraft manufacturing were not, however, compatible. A shortage of skilled mechanics, union problems and production failures led to delays. It was not until the plant was handed over to Vickers Management that the first Spitfire came off the Birmingham production line 10th June 1940, 23 in June, July, 37 in August and 56 in September. Production rapidly improved at its peak. 320 Spitfires were produced per month and 12,000 of the 20,000 Spitfires that were eventually built came from Rummage. In order to reduce the risk to production from bombing raids, the various components required to build a complete Spitfire were distributed to multiple smaller factory sites. Final assembly was constructed using a series of jigs that held the airframe for assembly. The arrogant line of Spitfires were arrived through a series of complex curves and fuselages alone being built up from a, seat, a set of 19 separate frames. 
Upon completion, every plane was flight tested ahead of delivery. Due to the need to get the aircraft rapidly into service, this involved a completely short flight. Initially, the plane would take up to 1,000 feet and the engine, the flight surface tested for trim. Provided that this proved satisfactory, the test pilots would then conduct a 20 to 30 minute series of maneuvers. With the engine set at 3000 RPM, the plane was put into a full dive. Once trimmed at 460 miles per hour, hands were removed from the joystick and feet from the pedals to ensure that the Spitfire remained stable. Alex Hansworth, the chief test pilot at Castle Bombers, tested 2360 planes in this manner. Spitfires were thrown from the factory to the squadrons by a team of volunteers. Around 20% of pilots who did this were women. Planes required overseas were crated up and then reassembled from kits. Although Spitfires were immediately success when used during the withdrawal from Dunkirk, it was the Battle of Britain that served to cement their fame with the public. More Hunter Hurricanes actually took part in the battle, but the higher victory to loss ratio and the Spitfire its legendary status. The Battle of Britain was the first major military campaign fought entirely by air forces, running from July to, through to October 1914. It started with the Luftwaffe attempting to destroy the Royal Air Force ahead of a planned invasion of Britain by ground forces. The Royal Navy had overhauled supremacy at sea, so it was vital to the German High Command that they gained air superiority. To this end, attacks were directed initially at, point, at ports rather than airfields, and finally, an attempt to break the morale through the terror bombing of cities, a tactic known as the Blitz. The Spitfire was tasked with engineering the ME-109, the Luftwaffe's main fighter aircraft. Aerial battles took place in clear blue skies, with contrails indicating the tracks of the combatants. While both sides claimed greater success rates than they actually achieved in practice, the loss, loss rates of the Luftwaffe were to become unsustainable. They had underestimated the strength and ability of the RAF, and the visible success of the Spitfire in dogfights gave the public a much needed morale boost. Due to the romantic image of the lone warrior fighter pilot, the men who flew the Spitfire became equally as famous as the planes themselves. The incredible exploits of pilots such as Douglas Bladder only served to reinforce this image. Bladder, who had lost his leg in a pre-war flying accident, rejoined as a Spitfire ace with 22 additional successes to his name. Captured after bailing out in France 1941, he was sent to a prisoner of war camp where he made repeated attempts to escape. He became such a nuisance to his captors that they threatened to take away his legs and eventually held him at the infamous Kurzel Castle. The Mark IX Spitfire that had become chosen for this model had been given the commemorative markings of J.E. Hyphen J. The resignation is signed with the greatest Spitfire ace, Jenny Johnson. Joining the RAF just before the war, Jenny Johnson crashed his first Spitfire just four days after flying it for the first time. The crash caused the, the reassurance of an old rubby injury, which made flying almost impossible. He was given the choice of training pilots to fly the Tiger Moth or having an operation amidst the Battle of Britain. Having recovered from the operation, Johnson rejoined his squadron at its field base, RUF Court Royal, near Norwich. His first successful air action occurred in January 1941, where he 
shared the claim of damaging a Doma bomber. Nicotti flying Spitfire 1, 2 and 5. He became an ace, recognised as having achieved 5 or more verified kills. By September of that year, almost exclusively his combat duels were with enemy fighter planes and internal victories were all against ME 109s, for which he, the early Spitfire proved a close match. Johnson attributed his success in shooting down enemy aircraft to his skills with a shotgun, claiming the principles of deflecting, deflecting shot against wheel aisle farm and airplanes were exactly the same, except that the planes could sometimes return fire. The best fighter pilots were usually men who had shot game and wildfowl. John and Johnson's favourite Spitfire was the Mark 9 EN398, which he first flew in March 1943. Now raised to the rank of Wing Commander, he earned the right to have his own personal initials on the aircraft. Over the next five months, he gained 11 victories in this new plane. Almost all of them fought against the new, much feared FW 109. Upgrading to further Mark 9 Spitfires, Johnson continued to take part in aerial combat through the end of the war, ranking up over 500 missions. He had the distinction of substation combat due to Spitfire on only one occasion. He saw action at Dipley, Dunkirk, and the Battle of Borg. In total, he had been credited with 34 individual victories over enemy planes, with a further 24 claims of shared for damaged aircraft. The Spitfire saw action in almost all theatres of war, initially helping to defend the British forces as they retreated from France at Dunkirk, Spitfire became key to the fighters' defence in the Battle of Britain. Once the tide of war began to turn, the aircraft was sent to defend Morata. A special erection party was established at Glummer in July 1942. To assemble and test fly aircraft created up and sent there from Britain by sea. In October, 116 Spitfires were assembled, test flown and cannon tested for action in just over a week. Over Germany, models of the plane were fitted with no armaments but equipped with long range fuel tanks to make visual high altitude reconnaissance flights. More than 1,000 Spitfires were sent to Russia where they joined the Soviet Air Force on the Eastern Front. In the Far East, Spitfires faced the Japanese Zero at Singapore and in Australia they defended Darwin. The V-1 flying bomb, a new self-guided terror weapon, required fast fighter planes to use as interceptors. Doodlebugs could be downed by flapping the wings. Spitfires claimed 303 kills. The basic airframe of the Spitfire provided to be extremely adaptable. As enemy aircraft became increasingly capable, the Spitfire had to adapt accordingly. In total, there were 24 marks of Spitfire and many sub-variants, each with each mark, which were adapted to accept ever more powerful engines and far greater loads than the aircraft was originally intended to encounter. It was quite remarkable that during the 12, ye 12 years from con conception thought to the project's conclusion in 1948, there was no significant failures of the basic design. A testament to the original genius of R.J. J. Mitchell and the supplement teams of engineers led by Joseph Smith. Although the Mark system intended the version of the Spitfire, the numbers did not necessarily reflect the chronological order. The first Spitfire mark is to have a top speed of 362 miles per hour. Although it is slightly slower, the Mark IIs had far better rate of climb and maximum ceiling height. 
In the next denotation, the mark five and mark six, saw the introduction of a hippos cannons and increased carrying capacity and overall range. The Mark IX was an inherent measure brought into production ahead of the Marks Seven and Eight, specifically to tackle the threat created by the introduction of the Luftwaffe's new Focke-Wulf 190. The first Mark IX were originally Mark Vs, adapted to take the Rolls-Royce Merlin 66. Tested by the Air Fighters Development Unit in April 1942, the Associated Report stated The performance of the Spitfire 9 is outstandingly better than the Spitfire 5, especially at heights above 20,000 feet. On the level, the Spitfire is consistently faster and climb is exceedingly good. It will climb as easy, easily to 38,000 feet and when leveled off, these can be made to climb in stages to above 40,000 feet by building up speed on the level and slight zoom. Its maneuverability is as good as a Spitfire 5's, up to 30,000 feet and above is much better. At 38,000 feet is capable of a time speed of 368 miles per hour and is still able to move well for fighting. Mark 9 versus the Mark 1. The following data, which I'm going to read to you, shows a comparison as just how far the Mark 9 of 1942 had developed in comparison to the Mark 1 introduced just before the start of World War II. On the engine, Mark 9, Rolls-Royce Merlin 55, power 1,720 horsepower. The Mark 1A, the Mark 1, a Royal Royce Merlin 3, power 1050 horsepower. Max speed of the Mark 9, 404 miles per hour at 21,000 feet. The Mark 1, 367 miles per hour at 18,600 feet. The rate of climb, the Mark 9, 4745 feet per minute at 10,000 feet. The Mark 1, 2,175 feet per minute at 10,000 feet. The ceiling or total attainable height. The Mark 9, 42,500 feet. The Mark 1, 34,400. The combat range of the Mark 9 was 434 miles. The Mark 1, 425. The weight of the Mark 9 was 5,090 pounds. The weight of the Mark 1, 4,306 pounds. That's empty. The total loaded weight of the Mark 9 was 7,400 pounds. And the total loaded weight of the Mark 1 was 5,935 pounds. The wingspan of the Mark 9, 32 feet and 6 inches. The wingspan of the Mark 1 was 36 feet and 10 inches. The length of the Mark 9 was 31 feet and 1 inch, while the Mark 1 was 29 feet and 11 inches. The total height of the Mark 9 was 12 feet 8 inches, while the Mark 1 was 9 feet 10 inches. The armament or weaponry of the Mark 9 was 2. 0.303 Boeing machine guns and two 20mm cannons, while the Mark I was eight 0 0.30 Boeing machine guns. So they had the Mark had a cannon. <laughs> Mark IX Spitfires can be recognised by their four blade propellers and the six exhaust pipes to either side of the engine carolling. The circular mirror above the couplet replaced the previous rectangular mirror. Production of the Mark 9 came to an end as the Supermarine Aviation Works in Southampton in June 1943. 
Further Spitfire production continued exclusively at the Castle Bromance factory until 1945. There is a bit of information about the history of the Spitfire as well as a bit of its specs for the Mark IX. Now, a bit about the man who had the vision of this airplane. The Spitfire resulted from the engineering skills and vision of Reginald Mitchell, the chief designer engineer at Supermarine Aver Aviation Works at Southampton. In 1928, the Supermarine plant, which was principally involved in the production of flying boats, was taken over by the Victor's Armstrong Company. Mitchell was so highly regarded that one of the main stipulations was that he should stay on as the main designer for the next five years. Born in Staffordshire in 1895, R.J. Mitchell designed 24 aircraft for Supermarine between 1920 and 1936. Mitchell was given funding to develop a series of aircraft to compete in the Skernsizer Trophy, a competitive race for seaplanes and flying boats that was held 12 times between 1913 and 1931. Intended to encourage technical advancements in civil aviation, it became a contest for speed over a triangular course of up to 350 kilometers. Mitchell engineered several supermarine versions into the competition over the years, culminating in the Supermarine S6, which won the race in 1929. His Supermarine S6B won the trophy again in 1931 breaking the world airspeed record a fortnight later and ending his quest to perfect the design of a racing seaplane. Ultimately, the lessons learned from these development craft culminated in his most famous plane, the Spitfire. The, this iconic aircraft was developed to meet the government specification F7 forward slash 30 for a new all-metal fighter plane. Mitchell's initial proposal, the Type 224, decided to be a complete failure. But this only spurred him and his team to return to the drawing board and come back with something far more elegant and superior. Two key design features were adopted in the new aircraft. A metal monochrome body and a elliptical wing up to this time, military aircraft have favoured the inherent strength of the biplane and conventional technology of wood and canvas construction. The restrictions that this imposed on the specifications of a fighter, however, were speed, gave you a critical advantage, meant that new technologies had to be adopted. The semi monocore construction meant that the aerodynamic forces were absorbed through the skin of the airframe a stressed deutanium attached to a series of frames. The Spitfire's specific elliptical wing was designed to have the thinnest possible cross section which employed it to have a higher top speed than conventional fighters. In addition, the wing design provided the inherent stability and a retractable undercarriage. Development of the first prototypes began in 1935 and the first planes flew in March 1936. Well received from the outcast, refinements such as improved control surfaces and a better propeller so impressed the Ministry of Defence that an initial order of 310 aircraft was placed as early as June. Mitchell continued to redefine the design until his untimely death in 1937. 
when the key design work for significant variants was taken over by Supermarine's new chief designer, Joseph Smith. Due to difficulty in both getting the manufacturing technology to work and limitation in production capacity, the initial order ran behind schedule, with the first production planes not arriving until 1938. The name Spitfire was adapted for the aircraft. This originally Related from a Elizabethan English word meaning someone of strong or fiery character. Alternative name suggestions for the plane included Snipe and Shrew, but these were quickly rejected. And that is a bit of the information about the visionary behind the Spitfire as well. Quite a lot of information for you guys there. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let's see. I think, yeah, I've near enough come to the end of this build. So let's have a look at the finished product. And there, and there we have it. Oh my word. It was not easy at all, as you guys could probably gather. I had to change my position so often get this lovely, lovely model of the Spitfire, a Mark 9 Spitfire, just in case you were wondering, and if I didn't say it enough during my information of it, but oh, oh boy, even that bit just sort of spin, but there we have it, my build of the Submarine Spitfire Mark 9, hope you enjoyed don't forget to comment, rate, subscribe, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Dave, recovering from this build.